Hello and welcome everyone! My name is Lily, and in this video I'll go through a production and narrative deep dive of one of my favorite games from 2022 that took over my daily life without me even realizing it. And such game is... this little guy right here. It almost looks harmless, but that's how it gets you. Twisted Wonderland If you clicked on this video without knowing what the heck that even means, first of all, hello again, thanks for being here. I wanted to make this video essay covering Twisted Wonderland because, honestly, this game has so much lore and such an interesting concept, it really deserves more videos about it. Plus, I personally love super long videos about niche topics that sometimes I didn't even know about. So hey, I figured, why don't I bring one of those into the world? I have some time to kill anyway. Of course, after I realized how much content I would have to research through, I did want to give up and walk into the ocean. I had an epiphany. I am going to throw myself into the sea. But at that point, I was too committed to stop, so here I am. On that note though, a few disclaimers. Number 1. I am occasionally prone to moments of having a small brain, so even though I tried to look up everything I could and reread the stories and events, I may get a few things wrong here and there, and in case that happens, do correct me in the comments. Number 2. I am occasionally going to refer to Twisted Wonderland as Twist, so it's faster to say and because I'm used to the abbreviation online. At least it's better than Disney trigger warning. Number 3. I am not affiliated with any of the very important people responsible for making this game. I'm just here to gush about how I like these characters and the story and the world. Number 4. As I'm sure it's obvious, English is not my main language, so I've put captions on the video to help if my pronunciation of the words is a little wonky for listeners. And finally, number 5. I absolutely love and care deeply for every single character in Twist. They consume every free space in my brain and make it rot 24-7. And because of that, I want you all to know, every single joke I would make at their expense is from a place of care. They are clowns in a mouse-shaped clown car and they deserve to be treated like that. Okay? Okay then. With those out of the way, let's begin with a brief history lesson. The year is 2019. Notre Dame was burning, people were trying to storm Area 51, Baby Yoda captured people's hearts, and most of the world didn't know the difference between an IgG and an IgM. Amidst all of that, on January 31st, Disney Japan announced via a Twitter account that they were developing a new game with the help of publisher Aniplex, who's known for their work on games like Fate Grand Order and Demon Slayer, and animes like Black Butler and Madoka Magica. Aboard the project, as head of character design and scriptwriter was Yana Toboso, whose name should sound familiar to those into anime around 29, as Yana had a time in the spotlight as the creator of Black Butler. Yes, the same one I just mentioned. Meaning, Yana and Aniplex had already worked together before. If you were into anime discussion forums back then, I'm 100% sure you saw this face everywhere. Development was being handled by company F4 Samurai, who had worked with Aniplex before on a Madoka Magica game called Magia Record. In terms of game genres, Twisted Wonderland can be classified as, and bear with me for a moment, a mobile gacha visual novel narrative adventure JRPG card battle rhythm game. And yes, none of those words are dating simulator. I'm so sorry for your loss. The original premise of Twist was the following, Welcome to the Villain's World. The entire theme of the game was set around the popular villain characters of Disney media, like Scar, Ursula and Jafar. The player would be a sort of hero, brought into the world of Twisted Wonderland and enrolled into a prestigious magic training school, where a masked headmaster would help them return home. But the wealthy and delinquent students would cause trouble and stop the player. As far as I understand it, that was the earliest pitch, a basic isekai story with Disney inspirations shoved in there. On a side note though, if anyone watching this doesn't know what the term isekai means, it's basically an insanely popular subgenre of fantasy in which a character is taken from their world into a different one. Think Alice in Wonderland, but with a power system, and the same town, over and over, and the same protagonist, over and over. The method of being transported is usually by various different ways of getting deceased, or by getting hit by Truck Kung himself, which is the classic, but not in Twisted Wonderland. In this one, you just get run over by a horse. What can I say? It's a horse. 
Anyway, I'm getting off topic. Throughout 2019, more information about the game was steadily released. On March 23rd, the game was featured in the Anime Japan convention in Tokyo, and this famous key visual for Malayas was revealed. Look at him, he's beautiful. A day after, on March 24th, the staff started to release promo images of a new character every day, until the entire cast was revealed by August. Also in August, the game was opened for pre-registrations. A new key visual was shown and they released a small part of the opening song, though knowledge of the story was still pretty vague at this point. Nowadays, if you play the game or if you read the synopsis online, you'd see that not much has changed from the basic premise. You still have the magic school and the isekai plotline and the looking for a way home conflict, all that jazz. I'd say the only outdated bit was the delinquent students who interfere with the player part. Currently, they're not so much as delinquents as they are generally unhelpful, competitive and violent jerks that only care about saving their own butts. However, their grades are usually top-notch, for some of them. Unfortunately though, the headmaster helping is straight up false marketing. Regardless of story details, with each new announcement, the game gained a bit more of hype around it, with people excited to see what would come of this unexpected creative team and unique premise. On February 23rd of 2020, countdown images started to be uploaded every day to the Twisted Wonderland Twitter account, with a different character and the remaining number of days until launch. And finally, on March 18th, 2020, a Japanese version of Twisted Wonderland was released and then no one heard anything about it for like two years. Twisted Wonderland. Well, that's not entirely true. People were talking about it, yes, but mainly in the Japanese circles. To have the Twisted Wonderland experience back then, you either had to get the Japanese version of the game, through proper or improper means, or you had to rely on fan translations that came out as the story moved along, on Tumblr blogs, wikis, YouTube videos, messenger pigeons, a random poster on the sidewalk… Either way, due to the lack of a global version and the other events happening at the time, most of the internet over by the west was focused on making their Animal Crossing islands look pretty and selling cat maids on eBay, instead of paying attention to the true masterpiece released. Even so, Twist managed to be quite a success, making around 4 million dollars monthly after its launch, and it didn't even take long before merchandising started in Japan. But not all hope was lost for the Western audiences, because back on January 20th, 2021, we were given an official, certified, Michael Mouse approved definitive translation of the game for the entire audience. Oh sorry, did I say entire audience? Yeah, no, I actually meant only the North Americans. Everyone out there do better, I guess. Yeah, unfortunately, even though there's plenty of hype for a full global release, the English version of the game is only available for download in the US and Canada. If you use proper means, that is. But hey, an official English version is better than nothing, right? It looks really good, runs smoothly, and we can finally get the true, unchanged, definitive story translated from the original, right? Right? There are a lot of changes between the two versions, enough to make it a video on its own, especially when it comes to dialogue and the interactions between characters. But today, I want to highlight two changes that essentially describe how the Twist English localization experience works under the Disney brand. Because, like it or not, Twist is a part of Disney. They own it, it's an adaptation of their versions of the fairy tales, their movies, and so they expect it to conform to Disney's corporate morals of the current times, especially here in the West. The first of these changes is regarding the character of Sam. I'll go over the rest of the supporting cast later, but for this I'll briefly explain Sam's role and his inspiration. Sam, no less name given, is the shopkeeper of the school and the token NPC for the player shop. Hey, Tony-chan! He is inspired by Dr. Facilier, the villain of the Princess and the Frog movie from 29. Given the time period and the location of the movie, the villain is portrayed as a voodoo practitioner, and his design elements show it, especially during the song visuals. As such, this is Sam's design in the original Japanese version. Notice anything different from the design I showed before? 
Here's the side-by-side -side comparison. As you can see, the entire bony makeup details and the mask pin on his coat were entirely removed in the North American version. The explanation for such change is quite simple and honestly very understandable – cultural sensitivity. Those kind of tattoos in real life are for actual designated voodoo practitioners, and Sam just isn't one. He's a shopkeeper. Sure, he calls the customers little imps and has connections on the other side, but he does not in any shape or form fall into a religious group that performs voodoo. Because of this, it seems that the North American version took off the bone symbols on his vest, the makeup and the mask pin to appease any possible conflicts. On a side note, the mask pin is actually a reference to the pendant used during the movie to transform Prince Naveen into a frog. Well, okay, fine, this change makes sense. Disney executives didn't want their funky little game coming over from Japan to upset anyone and make them lose their precious little money. We've got to have money. Got it. Cool, 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 cool. So then what's the deal with the bio razor? This is the part of the video where I shakily dip my fingers into controversial waters, but I still wanted to mention it because, as a bisexual person myself, I see how very little of actual good representation we get in media. Which in itself is another huge can of worms that I am not qualified or prepared to dissect, so I'm just going to put that quietly on the side this time. Let me explain properly. Kater Diamonds, a character very bubbly and social, originally had the following line during one of his personal stories. Wow. Looking at you this close, you're so cool, your eyelashes are so long, for a moment there I think I even wanted to date you." This dialogue is said to another male character of Kater's grade, Vil Schoenheit. In another one of his personal stories, when talking to his roommate about a new student, he said this line. If he had an older sister, don't you think she would be absolutely beautiful? And in the English release, both of these dialogues were entirely changed. The first one was turned into a question if Kater was dreaming and if the encounter with Vil was real. And the second one changed into a talk about the new students leaving dirty dishes laying around. Fascinating. So like, is he bi? And if so, only in Japanese? Unironically making this feel like the DSTL Super Hell confession all over again? And I can hear some of you saying, oh, those lines don't prove that he's bi, to which I respond, duh, this is Disney corporate we're talking about. They hate anything fun and especially anything remotely queer. And this Disney game is not going to sit Cater down and have him tell us his credit card number, married status and preference in dating. Twisted Wonderland can bypass the mouse's insane inspections in many areas, but I doubt they let it slide for a confirmed by character in the West version of the game without any major consequences for it. The original line itself is more of a way to open for interpretation about where Cater stands in terms of his sexuality and attraction. Rather, the whole deal is that in the original we at least get the subtext, we get the bare minimum, we get crumbs even. Cater has the vibes, he has the flirting, he could be bi-coded thanks to these lines of dialogue. It gives us at least the option to see this harmless headcanon exist, but the fact that these lines just don't exist in the English version takes away that whole aspect. If someone plays the translated game and isn't chronically checking for everything ever all the time, they just wouldn't know about this difference in localization. Like, I only found out about it after coming to Reddit's responses. Disney's first ex-bisexual, everyone. What makes the situation even sadder is that Disney villains, especially the older ones, have been said time and time again to take inspiration from real-life people that were part of the LGBTQ plus community and be blatantly queer-coded. Their drama, their gestures, their poise, their fashion, all of it was meant to show aspects of queerness. Of course, back then it was because being part of the community was seen as wrong and villainous. Hence why the heroes were shining examples of cis-hat romance and the villains were, you know, 
In recent years though, there was a sort of a take back of the old Disney villains by the community, who felt so drawn to these characters over the years. So it really sucks that this game, which is the whole point is to be an homage to villains of old Disney, has such a blatant censor in its official English version. And I think that, as a whole, this sort of discussion encompasses a lot of the energy the North American version of Twist has. We're going to respect a real-life religious culture by taking away a few makeup details that aren't realistic. That's fine. But oh, if you wanna be gay, that's not gonna fly, bucko. Let's have boys of all sizes and personalities wear heels and colorful clothing and put on makeup and be fine with gender non-conforming outfits and let them dance together and not be ashamed about it. Let's embrace fashion and self-expression. Oh, but if you call another boy cute or beautiful, that's illegal. And let's have a really freaking weird relation with the words servant and master, no matter how integral it is for a character story and their social standing struggles. Not only that, the changes done to the dialogue between characters conveys a completely different dynamic than the original one written, since the translation team seems to want to portray them in easy to understand western stereotypes. I highly recommend checking out this person's account over on Twitter. They highlight a lot of the changes made from localizing the lines over to English, how some jokes and wordplay can work in Japanese but not in English, how characters change their interactions and say things they would never normally say, and so on. Also, do not get me wrong, I am not saying this just to bash on the English version and say, um, actually, only true twisters play the Japanese version. No. Me and a lot of other people just don't know Japanese, and we don't have the time to learn it intricately to play the game. The translation is not ideal, not by a long shot, but it's what we have. However, I am not saying that the Japanese version is flawless and perfect and has great skin and never done anything wrong its entire life. No. Both versions have their own flaws. My point is not to drop one in favor of the other. Rather, my objective is for you, dear viewer and possible player, to not take everything at face value. Research things, look up sources. Does this line seem kinda sus to you in relation to the character's personality? Then there's no harm in doing a little in-depth search. Twist has a large fan base, more than ready to explain to you how you are wrong and your opinions are trash regarding anything you might be confused by. Speaking of such large fan base, it's like really big, like scary big, how many people are enjoying this game that is so relatively new to both markets. The fandom is everywhere, from Twitter to Reddit to Tumblr to AO3. Fan arts and fanfics and cosplays and intense blood fights, discussions, you name it. And despite the many, many controversies of the game over time, the fans have stuck around. There has to be a reason for that, right? I mean, for these many people to continue to be invested, Twist has to give something good in return. And indeed it does. For the answer lies in the simplest combination that any piece of media can have. An interesting story with surprisingly compelling characters. Let's be honest with ourselves for a moment here. What hooks us into Twist at first isn't the story, because when you get down to it, we already know most of the story. The original movies. Alice in Wonderland, The Lion King, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin. In the beginning, the game rehashes a lot of the same points as the movies did, but with an anime spin. It's only in later chapters that it starts to become something truly original and disconnected from the original stories. But honestly, having the stars be predictable and simple without any major plot twists is, in a way, helping the true hook of Twist shine, the character interactions. The true reason why so many people get addicted to Twisted Wonderland is because they find a character, or a group of characters, that connects so many happy brain cells in their mind, they just have to know what sort of disasters they get up to next. Will this character eat a box of nails? Will this character finally get good grades? Will this character finally get a restraining order? Will this character get away with murder? And that's where the true fun starts. 
Twist's cast isn't massive, just 22 main characters across the dorms, with 5 more in the supporting cast and a few in the reoccurring guest list. So, around 30 characters. Plus, there's enough anime tropes to fill any quota, like the big jock that looks scary but is actually very sweet, or the cute robots planning a revolution, or even the one that invests in cryptocurrency. There's also the funny stalker, the group mom, the quirky one that sleeps a lot, and Floyd, who does not fit in any box, yet somehow keeps winning first place in Japanese character polls. I love him a lot, he deserves it. Because of this diverse cast of personalities, you can pretty much make any scenario work, in very funny ways. A lot of the events are carried solely by character interactions, sometimes even without the input of the main character, which goes to show how strong the cast is. Or, you know, how empty the protagonist's seat is. Actually, both. Both apply here. Twisted Wonderland Twisted Wonderland is not an Otome game, no matter how many people insist it 100% secretly is. And it's not a romance game, no matter how many romantic dynamics it unironically ends up making. Twist is, in the simplest of terms, a visual novel. 90% of it is written text, and the remaining 10% is... whatever this is. And the way we experience all of it is through our lovely main character, you. You? You. Me. Me. We. Us. The, the, the main character is a player self-insert. Default name given you, but changeable whenever, the main character is most of the time just a conduit for the player to watch Disney movie cutscenes. <laughs> Talk to Mickey Mouse in a mirror. Now this is the point where most people, like 99% of people, would do this. Out of this house! Out of this house! Spirits be gone from this house! And pick dialogue options that give you the illusion of choice, but that are, in the end, truly meaningless. This is because the game is entirely written and designed around the fact that you are meant to put whomever you want in the main character's shoes. Be it yourself, an OC, an already existing character, you name it. Literally. You has no set age, no set height or weight, gender, appearance, voice, ethnicity, ass. It's free real estate. The only things that the game confirms that you has is a way to nice personality and a talent for putting people in their place, aka the bastards themselves. See, occasionally, as in during the climax of a story chapter or event, you is shown to be very plotty and crafty in terms of coming up with plans on the fly with limited resources, and actually making the characters who 90% of the time refuse to work together due to their clashing personalities actually unite for once towards a common goal. It's something the characters go out of the way to comment once or twice, how once you set their mind to something, it's impossible to change it. You is often the one thinking up of a solution to the problem at hand, but they are not the ones to execute it, acting more like a coach. They direct how the characters should act to resolve their business, and if the characters wanna live, they listen. Thanks to this, it's often joked about in the fandom that you is the school's unlicensed therapist, or that they're the only one holding the brain cell, which is a fair assessment. I wouldn't say you holds the brain cell all of the time, they have their moments of plot-needed obliviousness, but it's a solid share between them and the other responsible person in the friend group. 
Other than that, the part of Yu's personality that is supposed to be too nice often revolves around such friend group, since they often make fun of one another in very mean ways and get into a needed trouble. You know, just boys being dudes. But Yu never gets angry or resentful with them in the game, only mildly scolding on their antics and trying to solve the issue. This is probably due to the fact that if Yu was shown to be negative towards any of them in specific, it could damage the player's immersion, especially if said friends happen to be the player's favorite characters. So, Yu is written to be a forgiving and generally caring person who treasures their friends despite the headaches they cause. However, that's the extent of their canonized personality from the game. They are essentially a means for the player to see the world through their eyes, a walking and occasionally talking camera person. But now you may be thinking, hold on, if Yu is like that, with no face or voice, how are they represented in official media? And that's a very smart question. The answer is, they aren't. In terms of the game, Yu is never seen in a third-person view. But they have to represent the main character in some way, I can hear you thinking. I know, I am inside your mind. And that's true, they need some kind of stand-in for the player, someone to appear in official arts and trailers. And this is where Twist pulls out their secret card, the answer to their problems, the way to allow the player to keep their U interpretation personal and unique while also being represented in some way in official media. This cat, who is also basically the second protagonist of Twisted Wonderland. I know, I know, it's an odd claim, I'll explain, but first, I need to give some context as to who this little, adorable and irritatingly lovable rascal is and how that makes him important. And for that, we finally need to delve into the actual story of the game. Twisted Wonderland now, I won't go over the plot beat by beat, mainly because I really think that anyone watching this that hasn't played Twist yet should stop now, go play the game, and then come back and say how amazing it is and how you love me for recommending it. It's fine, the video will still be here when you're done. You're back now? Okay, good, moving along. When you first download the game, there's all this ominous voice stuff and a hand and choosing a dorm and seeing the different characters and fighting a giant monster. But all of that is a mix of gameplay, which I'll talk about later, and weird theory lore, which we will not mention today for my own sanity and work hours. Officially, the story starts at chapter 1 of the prologue, Stranger Waking. Throughout the prologue, you experience the typical isekai welcome of confusion and sudden exposition dump. All the while, this weird cat weasel thing is trying very hard to be seen as a threat. Despite how cuddly and fluffy and round he looks, oh yes he does, oh yes he does, we learn that we, aka you, have somehow landed in the prestigious school of magic known as Night Raven College, on the day of the welcoming ceremony for a new semester of students, of which you get mistaken by one and taken to the ceremony room along with the weird cat, who got mistaken for being our magical familiar. The person to cause such a mix-up is none other than Dyer Crowley, the headmaster <laughs> Oh sorry, the head mage of the school, aka the best character of this game and my sworn enemy. If you are in the fandom, you either ironically shit on Crowley for being a clown while absolutely loving him, or you unironically hate his guts for being an unhelpful clown. I definitely fall into the former category. I want to squeeze this man and watch his head pop and I love him to bits. He's fantastic. Anyway, head mage Crowley leads you to the mirror chamber, where we meet a glimfied version of the mirror from Snow White's Evil Queen, get our first glimpse at the characters and discover that we are utterly magicless. <laughs> So adding no magic to that list. Yeah, apparently the isekai order went wrong or haywire somewhere and we just ended up in a magic school by complete accident. What's even better is that when Crowley tries to look for directions to use Homeworld to send them back, because he is also charitable, he finds it that it simply doesn't exist in any of the records. Even the mirror can find a way back to your home. 
この者のをあるべき場所へ導きたまえ<笑>もう一度闇の鏡よこの者のどこにもないえこの者のあるべき場所はこの世界のどこにもない無である That's right, folks. In your real life country, you had canon the main character to be from that s not exist. Vanished. Gone. Reduced to atoms, as per dire Crowley's decree. Or you know, the other viable explanation is that we are from another dimension, separate from Twisted Wonderland. With no way back home, no phone, no identification, and no drip, Crowley feels bad for the situation his school put us in and gives you a temporary shelter while he finds a new way to send us packing. We are placed in an abandoned building that was once used as a dorm and later on gets adequately dubbed the Ranshackle Dorm. It came pre packaged with everything you could want dust, bugs, broken furniture, and ghostly roommates. At least they won't leave dishes and clothes lying around. There is, of course, a limit to Crowley's kindness, and you is made into the janitor person of the school to make up for the living expenses. As the prologue progresses, we get into all sorts of wacky hijinks, including but not limited to getting exposition about the Disney villains, setting a stone statue on fire, running over a guy with a cauldron, throwing a guy into a chandelier, getting expelled, mining at night, fighting an ink demon with the power of friendship, and at the end of the day, getting scammed into being an unpaid therapist for the school. Additionally, as the prologue concludes, we are drifted to this bop of a song as the opening. They did not need to go this hard, but I am so thankful that they did. But now you may be wondering, Lily, you still haven't explained your claim about the weird cat being the second protagonist. Oh, yeah. No, but for real, the reason I went through all of that before coming back to this is because said weird cat appears during the entire prologue, even after being thrown out, chased out, colored, and made into a marketable plushie. You see, this is Grimm, a monster with magical ability so great, according to him, that he is fated to become a powerful mage and rule the world. Hence, why he was quite offended that he never received a proper invitation to attend the school, so he decided to just let himself in. Besides Twiddle D and Twiddle Dung over here, Grimm is the character most guaranteed to appear next to the player, both in the main story and in events. When you become accepted into the school as a student, Grimm is accepted as your plus one. After all, you can't stay in a magic school without performing magic. So you both kinda fill the spot as a single student, though I think you get graded and tested separately, it's unclear, so don't worry about it. And because you are both technically students now, your official dorm house becomes the rundown Ranshackle dorm, with you becoming the prefect of the dorm, because no one wants to give Grimm a leadership position, the power would definitely go to his head. This makes it so that Grimm is always somehow glued to the hip of the player, going to classes together, being in same tests together, being flown to enemy friends together, they're a package deal, you can't separate them, please do not separate them. Do not. Not only does this make it so that 90% of the time Grimm experiences the same story beats as the protagonist, but he also serves a very important purpose asking questions. Like I mentioned before, you is a walking camera, mostly silent once the story gets going, so the player can fill in the spots as they wish in their imagination. But Grimm is there when the writers need someone to question how the rules of the universe work, giving it an opportunity for the players to learn it without it feeling too forced in. So, if you think about you as a camera, Grimm is the helpful mic attached to them, in which characters deposit exposition at the start of a new event or chapter, from mundane game rules to intricate traditions held at the school. He is also the character representative of the player during special event trailers and anniversary events. 
However, Grimm doesn't always represent the will of the player, especially at the start, coming off as obnoxious and full of himself. But one of the great things, not just about him, but with everyone else in the cast too, is that they change thanks to their experiences with the story and by interacting with you, something I'll go into more in depth once I explain the deal with these two. For now, Grimm is just our grumpy cat with dreams of world domination and easily bribable with tuna cans. This established dynamic right off the gate with the main character, Grimm and their dumb little position also serves as the perfect setup for any creative minds in the fandom to create their own you personas, appropriately called you sonas. Some artists go so far as to create their own custom dorm uniforms based on the Renshackle dorm aesthetic or on the bro Grimm wears. They also create their own nice Raven College school uniforms, since every character wears it differently, their special event attires, and even create entire comics about the main character settling into their new life at the dorm, like the artist Crystal Mula did with their Yusona Owen. And I know, I know, making your own version of the protagonist is nothing new in terms of fandom culture. But I think Twist is unique in the way that it wholly embraces the uniqueness every you can have. I was going to tackle the manga later on, once I talked about the adaptations of the game for other media formats. But I want to highlight something really freaking cool that happened with the release of one of the most recent episodes of the manga. The main character completely changed. During the first episode, we had this Yu, named Yuken, a pretty stoic guy that practiced Kendo. However, in the second episode, now under the management of a new artist, we follow this Yu, named Yuka, an easygoing girl who practiced Judo. And this feels very validating to the premise that anyone can be the main character of Twisted Wonderland, since even the official media are taking that route. He's Squidward! He's Squidward! You're Squidward! I'm Squidward! Are there any other Squidwards I should know about? Meow. <laughs> I'm out of here. So, for me, it's really charming to see people in the fandom express themselves through their usonas. And like, not to state the obvious, but these are so good. Twisted Wonderland legit has some of the most insanely talented creators in the fandom feeding us content, and I honestly couldn't be happier for that. The ones I showed before all have the socials of the artists in the description, so I definitely recommend checking them out. And hey, if you're feeling like it, go on and give it a shot, make a you of your own. It's as simple or as intricate as you want. Like I said before, their free real estate. To close off this introductory session, I want to go back to that getting exposition about the Disney villains part I mentioned earlier. Around chapter 9 of the prologue, we get this very helpful explanation about the role each villain plays in this world through a very subtle and intricately designed segment. No, who am I kidding? The ginger just comes up to you and explains everything, even though it doesn't really match his personality. But it's fine. We needed a quick and easy access to the plot anyway, so I can forgive it this time. You see, Night Raven College has seven stone statues at its main street, and each depicting one of the old villains from the movies. There's the Queen of Hearts, Scar, Ursula, Jafar, the Evil Queen, Hades and Maleficent. They are called the Great Seven, and are basically the representatives of each of the seven dorms in the school. And... shoot. I haven't explained the dorms yet. Okay, okay, so you know that one popular magic school franchise that sorts out children into four different dorms based on their personalities when they're like 10 years old? And then they're stuck for the next seven years in the same dorm? Yeah, do you remember how they put all the evil kids together in the basement dungeon? Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Night Raven College is none of that. I mean, for starters, all the students are evil, not just the green ones. The way the dorm sorting works is that, at the start of a new school year, they gather all the freshmen in that mirror hall we crashed into earlier, and their souls are judged by the glam goth Fabulous Mirror, who sorts them into one of the seven dorms. And okay, okay, so far I know it looks pretty similar to that one franchise that shall not be named, but that's where the similarities end. See, while there are similar people in the dorms, not all of them are cut from the same cloth. So I believe it's more about their potential in relation to the core morals of the dorm than their current personality. Or it could be both, I mean, I'm just reading too much into it. Either way, there's way more diverse personalities than just 
smart, brave, evil and the yellow one. And hey, if they're dissatisfied, they can always change dorms, it canonically can happen. Each dorm also has a leader, in the North American version they're called House Wardens, who basically embody the spirits of their dorm's patron, and each having their own vice leader, though the method of choosing them is different in each of the dorms. The dorm of Hartlebill's patron is the Queen of Hearts, which honors her strictness and severity in the form of her 5,084 rules that can be heavily enforced or not depending on how lax the dorm leader is. Their students are generally sociable and extroverted, often holding unbirthday parties. Scar is the patron of the Savannah Claw dorm, based on his persistent spirit and fortitude. The students in this dorm are 90% of the animal people we see in the series, the rest usually being in Hartslebule, and they have impressive abilities in athletics and martial arts. This dorm has a mixed bag in terms of personalities, ranging from angry to scheming to just being a nice lad. A lot of people describe them as the bully dorm, since they're hot-headed, but it would be more accurate to describe them as protective of those within their pack and being incredibly loyal to a fault. So picking fights left and right is not just exclusive to them, this whole school is a cesspool of fight-prone angry teens. The Octavinel dorm centers around Ursula's compassion and benevolence, and it's set entirely underwater. The dorm even getting a whole ass cafe run by the students called the Monstro Lounge, like the whale. The thing about this dorm is that the students are very smart, major in economics, wear fedoras willingly, and are not at all sketchy or deceitful. You can trust them. Would this face ever lie to you? Scarabia is the other major smart student dorm, and are even placed as rivals to Octavinel. The difference is that, being the dorm based on Jafar, they are more meticulous and mindful, being able to come up with solutions to sudden problems with discretion and tact. I mean, one could even call them schemes, but nah, they're just well prepared, and they're also apparently very good at astrology projections. The Evil Queen's tenacity and determination shapes Pomefiore's students, as they are not only masters of curses and poisons, but they're also the slayest dorm to ever slay. Yeah, on top of being very, very dramatic theater kids, they also put a lot of importance on acting with manners and serving the look. You cannot sit with them, especially with those toes out. Hades' diligence can be seen in Ignihide. Sort of. Of all of the dorms, this is the one you're given the least information regarding the students, other than the fact they're good of technology fueled by magical energy and engineering. AKA, they're introverts that prefer to stay in their rooms and talk to their online friends. Ignihide is officially the best dorm, I see this as an absolute win. Last but certainly not least, we have Diasomnia, noble and dignified like Maleficent. The students of Diasomnia are basically the VIPs, even getting their own special sitting area in the cafeteria. Not only are they insanely powerful and magic, but they're also powerhouses when it comes to academics and athletics. The average students don't interact with them often, and much less with their mysterious dorm leader, one of the most powerful wizards in the world. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Anyway, the dorm system is pretty cool actually, and the fact that each gets their own little pocket dimension for the dorm grounds it's so extra and excessive, it makes you wonder if that's where the school spends most of its money on. Why don't we get paid, Crowley? Why don't we get a pocket dimension for our dorm, Crowley? Where's all the money going, Crowley? Also, unlike the other franchise, there is no favorite dorm by the head mage. He'll throw any and all under the bus to save his own feathers. But wait up, hold on, rewind a bit. You may be thinking, compassion, 
fortitude, diligence, when did that ever apply to the Disney villains? And see, that's where we circle back to the exposition scene with the ginger in the prologue. It's during this scene that we discover that in the world of Twisted Wonderland, there's nothing villainous to these villain icons of old. Rather, their tales are talked about as if they were martyrs or even heroes. Let's take Scar, for example. We all know Scar, great hair, amazing song, impressive body count, arguably the crux of a very weird and deeply personal awakening for many. You want to know how they describe Scar in this universe? The king of beasts who ruled over the savannah. He earned his place in the throne through hard work and elaborate schemes. Once king, he made it so that hyenas would no longer be the pariahs and would instead live equally among his subjects. The same goes for the other villains too. They frame the Queen of Hearts as someone very capable and respected, Ursula as a woman devoted to helping merfolk as much as she could, and Jafar as a capable advisor who was so smart he get this, exposed a swindler that was pretending to be a prince to trick the princess. This lore is consistent, by the way. Throughout the story and even during events or side chess, it's always remarked on how great and admirable the Great Seven were in their own ways. And I find that a truly fascinating piece of world building because it sparks a curiosity in the player regarding the state of this world. Mainly, how do things come to be like this, so different from the stories we know? One possibility could be that, in the dimension of Twisted Wonderland, the original stories played out in a completely different way, and the villains were never evil to begin with. But that argument doesn't hold much water when you consider that references to Ariel's love of the land or Jasmine's and Aladdin's love story are still present in the narrative, implying that the original story beats still happened. From what I understand, the most accepted theory is that the original stories still occurred the same way as depicted in the movies. But then so much time passed and society changed so much that at some point the myth got distorted and retold over and over, to the point where the wickedness of the villains got twisted around, oh, just like the name of the game, into them being sorts of good and admirable people. Or maybe someone spread misinformation intentionally. But this feels weird, right? I mean, what's the point of having a Disney villains game where the whole slogan is welcome to the villains world and not have the originals remain as villains? They even expect you to know the movies, since throughout every episode you see glimpses of the original story play out in a slide format on your ghost mirror, don't worry about it. I mean, if you didn't know any better, you'd think the game was pulling the rug under you with false marketing. But that's how they get you. You see, Twist doesn't use the originals as villains, because during every episode we get a different villain in the form of one of the characters of the dorm in focus. Furthermore, while each of the episodes definitely has their unique spin, each of them also plays the events very close and inspired by the events of the original stories which the player can predict and theorize about if they know the original source material. And what's a better way to demonstrate this narrative structure in action than tackling Episode 1, The Crimson Tyrant. Twisted Wonderland in this section, I'll go over a summary of the narrative while also introducing the characters that play major roles during the episode and discussing their own inspirations and attributes that make them unique. Like in the prologue, I won't cover every single thing that happens, but I'll explain enough so that the changes that occur from the start to the end aren't too confusing. A bit of a warning before we start, I will generally spoil the climax and the ending of the episode, so if you still haven't gone and played Twisted Wonderland, this is kinda your last chance to experience it with fresh and spoiled eyes. Please do that! The game is so much fun when you don't know what's gonna happen, trust me on this. But anyway, without further ado, let's be- Oh, come on, who could it possibly be at this time of night? Ora, Ace! Just go in the room. Ace? How did you get this time? That head is... I'm not going to go to Heart's Labyrinth. I'm going to be the leader of this world. What? Well, this looks promising. 
After a weird prophetic dream sponsored by Disney Animations, we open the door in the middle of the night to discover the ginger from before, now colored and asking for a place to sleep. This is a Strapola, Lord Dumping Master himself and the third member of our merry band of best friends. If I had to describe Ace, I say he's a bit of an ass at the start. He's mischievous, allergic to following any rules or respecting any authority, a skilled liar that enjoys playing pranks on others, and, as seen by our first encounter in the prologue, gets a kick out of making fun of people. But hey, this sort of problem child behavior can be expected out of any student in this school, honestly. They really know how to pick him. What sets Ace apart is that he's surprisingly clever and quick-witted. Even though he has the potential to do well in his studies, he doesn't really put in the effort, but he's always able to adapt to new situations and make the most out of them to his own benefit. He can be also brutally honest when needed. A lot of the frustrations the player may be feeling towards a character or two are usually said by Ace to their faces in-game, no matter which level of seniority or power they may have over him. And I think this confrontational nature of his can elevate a lot of the negative opinion the player may have towards him at the beginning, since he gets the plot going and doesn't mince words about letting other characters know when they messed up. He also changes a lot when the story progresses, cherishing his friends and having moments of genuine honesty and vulnerability. But for now, he's still an angry boy, ranting about his house warden and how he'll never go back ever ever ever. His crime? Eating a tart. What can I say? The boy's got to eat. I'm sure this won't have a major lasting effect on the plot in any shape or form. Anyway, we provide him shelter and the game doesn't let us agree to sleeping in the same bed. This is so mean, let me say yes to the sleepover. So he crashes on the sofa for the night. In the morning we... Oh come on, another visitor, who could it be this time? Well, now it's a party. To complete the original friend group, we have Dulce Spade, a certified mama's boy and one of the contestants for the goodest lad around. Dulce is honestly one of the least evil children in this hellscape. He's not a goody two-shoes, far from it, actually. But when it comes to being an honest person and sincere boy who's just trying his best for his mom and trying to improve himself for the better, <laughs> Sorry, give me a moment. Okay, yes, he fits the description. You see, Deuce had one of those it's not a phase, mom, phases in middle school, where he acted like a delinquent, dyed his hair blonde, started skipping classes, and getting into a lot of fights. This behavior is later revealed to be because of his growing frustrations due to his slow academic learning and the lack of good grades despite his many efforts. His love for his mom didn't change though, and he always tried to help her, as he was the only man around in the house. It's one of the many reasons why he's skilled with mechanics and fixing things. However, because of his method of lashing out, his mom lamented his actions and wondered if she failed as a parent, something Deuce overheard during a conversation. Vowing to never make his mom cry again, he changed his behavior and is striving to become a proud model student at Night Raven College, though that is easier said than done. His delinquent persona still appears occasionally, especially when he's worked up about something unfair or cruel to others, jumping to settle things with his fists, especially when Ace provokes him, which is very often. Still, Deuce always means well and does above and beyond to help people and to prove himself. He's honestly a very good and compelling character. A lot of times his lack of tact is used for comedy, but when he gets moments to shine earnestly, it always makes me smile. He's also very neurodivergent coded, which makes him all the more relatable to me, to be honest. <laughs> An approved good boy, 11 out of 10. Bring back his cauldron spell, please, I miss it. It was the funniest recurring gag ever. With you, Grim, and Deuce accompanying him, Ace goes back to the dorm to apologize for eating the tart and hoping it makes the dorm leader take off the collar. And you may be wondering, what even is the deal with that collar? You see, it's a signature spell that 
Oh god, I haven't explained the signature spells yet. Uh, okay, okay, so real quick. A unique magic or signature spell, as it was translated to North American, is just like the name implies, something unique to the caster. It's a type of spell only they can do, and can range through all sorts of usefulness and overpowered levels, like controlling someone's mind or body, placing very specific curses, creating sentient clones, or just summoning water from a very small amount of magic. In this instance, Ace's House Warden used his unique magic known as Off With Your Head, which places a color on someone and seals their magic until further notice. Green was also hit by this spell in the prologue. Since mages in this world have a constant access to magic in their body, restricting it away is equivalent to being unable to use one of your limbs, hence why Ace wants this color off ASAP. So, they go to the dorm, only to be stopped at the entrance by another ginger. Wait, we already know this one. Well, nothing wrong with formally introducing him, anyway. Kater Diamond is the first junior we meet from Hartslabule, and due to his seniority over the younger students, plus his friendly attitude, he's often the one playing mediator between the troublemakers of the dorm. But don't be fooled, Kater is far from a happy-go-lucky sweet bean. So, so far from it. He's so far from it. His socialization skills make it so he's pretty good at reading people and being aware of social cues. He's often shown to use his words wisely in order to get the best outcome out of a conversation, or to only reveal what's strictly necessary in any given situation, whatever gives him the least trouble. Cater is incredibly clever, but he doesn't do well academically, because of a difficulty to focus on things he isn't interested in. Did I forget anything? Alright, he's an influencer. In the world of Twist, we learned about the existence of Magic Cam, a popular media site clearly meant to be a parody of Instagram, of which Cater is addicted to, posting things 24-7 and constantly asking to take pictures of subjects he deems would get him the most likes. Not only that, but he's always keeping up with the latest gossip and trends, which comes in handy when we need to stock, I mean, gather information about a student. On a side note though, it would've been so cool if Twist went the same route as Kingdom Hearts 3 when it comes to magic and posts. For those that don't know, Kingdom Hearts 3 makes some special loading screens with, um, King Instagram? Disney Instagram? Posts made by the characters in the game. It's very cheesy and it doesn't make a lot of sense, but such is the way with Kingdom Hearts and I love it. Can you imagine if we could see the same with Twist, with funny Magicum posts appearing on the loading screens regarding the main story or the current events? Anyway, Cater's influencer status leads to what most fans consider to be Cater's biggest crime against humanity, his dialogue. Every once in a while, he used a variety of modern slang and abbreviations that literally no one in this god's green earth has ever used. Granted, a lot of this is due to the localization dialogue that pretty much makes everyone's dialogue a lot more cartoony. But still, Cater's is in a league of his own. You can clearly feel that the people translating his dialogue have no idea how internet talk works nowadays, so they just make him use a bunch of hashtags before everything, or randomly spout combinations of words like yikes on bikes. But honestly, I kinda love it. It's outdated and completely disconnected from how normal people talk, but it's so funny in its own weird way. Like, no one talks like that. Go off, King. Do it. Give us nothing. I support you, Cater. You may be cringe, but you are free. And he is also a clone. Yeah, Cater's unique magic, Split Card, lets him create a bunch of sentient clones at once, which he uses to send us packing out of the dorm, because Ace didn't bring an apology tart as per the rules. 
It's okay guys, we can cancel him on Magic Twitter after this. Sadly, we are indeed forced to retreat and attend class as normal until it's lunchtime. But hey, at least we get a moment to breathe. no main street, Great Seven no Sekizo got up to the jump. I know Stinny Narate, Konoga Queen, you are Nanats no Ryoga Arundeo. Get Kesano! You again. We get intercepted in the cafeteria by Cater and a new character, Trey Clover, the vice house warden of Harslebule. They are pals, they are friends, they are very good buddies. They were roommates, I think. The rooms in their dorm still confuse me. And they were roommates. God, they were roommates. Trey's deal is that he thinks he's the most normal person on campus, but that is a complete lie. He's weird. He's a weirdo. He doesn't fit in and he doesn't want to fit in. Have you ever seen him without his stupid hat on? That's weird. His role is often to be the mom of the dorm, with cooking, cleaning, fussing over the younger students and making sure they brush their teeth. He's got a thing for teeth. Don't worry about it, it's fine. He says it's normal. Trey seems mature and forgiving, but that is but a ruse. He holds the biggest grudges and cares for them as if they were his precious baking appliances. Just like everyone else in this goddamn school, he would only go out of his way to help someone if it A. makes his school life easier and less stressful, B. it's an emergency, C. if he can get something out of it, or D. all of the above. If none apply, he'll happily watch you burn and draw zero attention to himself. The same applies to his academic achievements, doing the bare minimum to not thank the dorm but nothing more than expected. A lot of people wrongly describe Trey as the boring one, or the one that has no personality. Falsehoods, lies, slander. Trey is only seen as boring because he's often paired with the most openly insane people, serving as the straight man to their antics. But Trey Clover, the hat man himself, is far from boring. The second you think you know him, he pulls out a serial killer line from his dorm cards and shoves his hand down your mouth to check your teeth. I am a Trey Clover apologist and he has done nothing wrong in this entire life. He's got everything. Except cake. And just like Cater, he's a junior who smooths things over when conflict arises, which makes sense considering he's the vice dorm leader. He does his job very well, except for the part where he was also supposed to keep the leader in check so the power didn't go to his head. But hey, no one can be perfect, leave him alone. Because of his talent in making baked goods, he's also the one responsible for making the sweets for the unbirthday parties, which included the tart Ace 8. So Trey offers to bake a chestnut tart if we gather the ingredients necessary. Sure, why not? It's not like we have anything better to do, like study in the school, or you know, look for a way home, maybe? Nah, that's dumb, let's help make a tart. It's in this Master Chef section that we learn more about Trey's unique magic, Paint the Roses. I, I forgot to mention that his spell name is actually Doodle Suit, and the name was entirely changed in the localization to North America. So Paint the Roses is an entirely new name that doesn't match the original spoken text, and the original name of the spell is actually Doodle Suit which basically allows him to change the characteristics of something, like taste, color, smell, stuff like that. This surely would not be foreshadowing for something else, don't worry about it. Anyway, no time to give the tart to the housework in today, so we get to have another sleepover with Ace and Deuce this time. The friendship levels are increasing, maybe we can play Monopoly someday. The next day, after a session of rose painting with Cater's clones, we reach the unbirthday party grounds and come face to face with the Crimson Tyrant himself, Riddle Roseheart, a third ginger. I left Riddle for last because before I dissect his character, I need to first explain the whole deal about the character inspirations slash representations in the narrative. Remember what I said about Sam a few sections ago? He is inspired by Dr. Facilier, the villain of the Princess and the Frog movie from 29. 
You see, most of the characters in Twist are supposed to be inspired by a villainous or antagonistic character from the original movies. Some inspirations are pretty clear in terms of appearance, others you have to see the character's mannerisms and personality in the story, and others… we'll get to them. But why would the inspiration matter? You see, knowing who the character was inspired by allows you to know what sort of role they'll play in the episode's story, aka what character they will represent. For example, most of the House Wardens are based on the main villain of the movie, with one exception. So you can predict that their inner conflicts will drive the story forwards and paint them in a villainous light for the duration of the episode. Such is the case with Riddle, he is supposed to represent the Queen of Hearts in the original story, overly strict, prone to fits of anger and enforcing nonsensical rules over his card soldier subjects, which the rest of the named characters are meant to represent, Ace of Hearts, Two of Spades, Three of Clovers and Four of Diamonds. Hey, I never said they had to be important named characters in the original movies, they just needed to be villains or associated with villains. We can see this more clearly once we cover the other dorms, but the rule of thumb is that the other characters are usually the supporting villain cast while the house wardens, again with one exception, are the main villain representative and embody their flaws. That is why when Riddle sees that Ace brought him a chestnut tart to apologize, he rejects it in favor of following rule 562, one must never bring a chestnut tart during a birthday party. So, despite all the efforts we went through to make that tart, he orders it to be destroyed. <laughs> Which does not sit right with Ace, Deuce or Grim. いや言うね。そんなルールに従ってタルトを捨てるなんてバカだって思うだろ。ふざけんなよ。俺もエースに賛成です。もちろんルールは守らなければいけないものだとは思いますが、さすがにトッピすぎる。but seemingly only them, everyone else in the dorm is too afraid of Riddle's unique magic to speak up against him, even though throughout the chapter we have seen glimpses of how the dorm students are miserable having to follow these stupid nonsensical Queen of Hearts rules. Alas, the Queen's order is absolute. Hey, Kate! <laughs> So we are thrown out again after a bizarre encounter with this lovely fella. Meant to represent the Cheshire Cat, we discover that both him and the Trey were childhood friends of Riddle's, and that actually, guys, Riddle isn't that bad, and actually his mom was the problem. So you know, let him get it out of his system. I'm sure it's gonna be fine. Yeah, no. If the Liu Chao is the same as his mother, then he should tell it straight. Tell it straight. If he's a crazy guy, then he should tell it straight. どうすんのあいつがみんなに嫌われて孤立してくの見てるだけおいエースそれとも何あんたも首をはねられるのが怖くて黙ってるってだっせえな何が幼なじみだそんなんダチでもなんでもねえわこら君たち図書室では静かに
Sucks for them though, because the Jew only accepts magic attacks. And the two of them can't even finish one spell before Riddle KOs their magic with his signature spell. It's regrettable, but at least no one got hurt. So let's go back and think of something else. Oh wait, Ace. Ace, what are you doing? Ace, put the steel chair down. Ace, no, Ace, stop! <laughs> Yeah, we're all gonna die. Okay, so even though he lost, Ace still threw down against Riddle and spat some truths in his face. Which led more dorm students to call out how the housewarden tyranny was making them absolutely miserable. With his entire worldview challenged, Riddle kinda started going berserk and using his signature spell on everyone around him, forcing Trey to come in clutch and use his own signature spell to stop him. Yeah, remember how his doodle -doo suit can rewrite properties of things? Apparently, there's a handy dandy loophole that means it can also overwrite the source of a magic spell, which I guess it makes sense. It is a property. Hence, how Trey was able to make Riddle's magic into his magic instead, even for a small period of time. This didn't have the calming effect desired though, and Riddle tries to force his spell to work over and over again, resulting in a phenomenon we come to know as overblot. Riddle, あ、本気でやる気だったのかよ。さすがにやりすぎだろう。ば、バケモノだ。トレイに魔法を上書きされた。僕の魔法より君の魔法の方が優れてるってこと。そんなことあるわけないだろう。リドル。一旦落ち着
Oh, did I fail to mention that tiny detail? Yeah, the boost and the drip are literally to die for, since apparently if you stay in an overblotted state too long, you get a one-way ticket to the underworld. At least you look fabulous in your casket. And now Riddle's going through it. Goodbye, little man. We barely knew you. Oh, wait, never mind. Trey grew a backbone and he's going to go for it. Okay, okay, let's commit therapy, I guess. After you win the first overblock battle, which is way too hard for being the first one, you either get good or get owned. <laughs> We see a glimpse into Riddle's life from his own perspective, with stellar good voice acting, and I can finally dissect his character to my head's content. Riddle Rosehearts is essentially the game's first antagonist, fulfilling the villain role for episode 1. Because of this a lot, and I do mean a lot of his actions during the entire book are meant to be seen as wrong and excessive and tyrannical. He is, as the title implies, the Crimson Tyrant. But there's so much more to Riddle's character than just being an angry red boy who sticks to the rules. And we learn that with the post overblot flashback, a trademark for every overblot recovery, where the already emotionally compromised victim is subjected to experiencing the worst times of their lives again, so we, the audience, can understand why they ended up like that. A fair exchange, I would say. You get to relieve trauma, while I get pages of character lore worth discussing. Riddle was born and raised in the Queendom of Roses. We learn that both his parents were magic doctors, and while it's unclear what happened to his father, his mother is the front and center of all his memories, due to how she raised them. Such methods of childcare are why she is arguably the most hated character in the entire game universe, even more than Crowley. Screw this silhouette in particular. Apparently, his mother prepared him from a very young age to become a powerful magic user. She did so by controlling every aspect of Riddle's life, his clothing, his diet, who he interacted with, and so on. She was also very strict with his studying schedule, reminding him multiple times that studies are the most important thing to do and that playing is a pointless activity. We learn in the manga that Riddle was taught from childhood to be careful with the amount of calories he ate and that even his birthday cake was low on sugar and full of nutrients meant to improve his cognitive function, despite the hopes the little boy had of eating a lovely strawberry tart he saw at the neighborhood's bakery window. Said bakery was owned by Trey's parents, and one day, while he and Chenya were playing outside Riddle's house, they caught the boy's attention. Oh, Riddle was incredibly lonely, spending his days either studying with his mom or studying on his own during independent study time. But on that day, when Trey and Chenya invited Riddle to play together outside, he found himself incredibly tempted to. And I mean, just who wouldn't? Look at this little guy, little hedgehog. Who would say no? So every day, for an unknown amount of time, Riddle would sneak out during his independent study time to actually live like a normal child and play around with his friends, something he deeply cherished and loved. He even gets to try out one of the tarts he wanted so much, when the boys discovered he never had one. Since Trey's parents owned the bakery, he and Shenya give Riddle the opportunity to try his very first tart. 
真っ白なお皿に乗った真っ赤なイチゴのタルト僕にとってはどんな宝石よりキラキラ輝いて見えた一口食べたタルトはすごく甘くて食べたことがないくらい美味しくて僕は一口ずつ味わいながら夢中になって食べた時間を忘れて。And that's when the card castle tumbled for little Riddle. His mother discovered about his escapades and dragged Riddle back home, with panels of the manga showing that she even dragged Mr. and Mrs. Clover into it, not caring for Riddle's distress over the situation. He got harshly scolded and reprimanded, and despite his pleas for forgiveness, she instead doubled down on the overbearing control, becoming more strict than she already was, and forbidding Chenya or Trey from ever interacting with Riddle again. With no way to go against his mother, Riddle followed her rules to the letter, with such a way of life becoming his everyday norm, until he entered Night Raiden College a year before the game's story started. Rule を破れば楽しい時間まで取り上げられてしまうだからお母様の決めたルールは絶対に守らなきゃこの町で一番優秀なお母様はいつでも正しいはずだから Because of such harsh upbringing, we as the player can finally understand why Riddle preaches so much about authority and order. If Ron disrespects the rules, no matter how nonsensical they may be, and gets away with it, then why did he have to abide by them so strongly all those years? His strictness doesn't come from actually believing all the Queen's Hearts rules are just and correct. He even admits that he wouldn't mind doing things differently, like how he did want to eat the tart Ace Maid, or how he flavors many aspects that clash with the rules of the Queen. At first, his enforcement of the etiquette may seem to come from a place of entitlement, but in reality, he feels a strong sense of obligation and fear from rebelling against the status quo, since it only makes things worse for him and others in the past. いっぱいタルトが食べたいお外でいっぱい遊びたいもっといっぱいお友達が欲しいよ教えてママどんなルールに従えばこの苦しさは消えるの Because of such feelings, he built this intimidating image by punishing any dorm members that went against authority, be it his, the queen's rules, or the teachers. Riddle won the crown of dorm leader after his first week of enrolling n i g h t r a v e n College, and he kept it on his head with an iron fist and metal collars. Unaware of how he was mirroring his mother's way of teaching, and not noticing how he was making everyone's lives worse. Trey, unfortunately, also didn't help much in this situation, mainly because he felt guilty about the fact he wasn't able to help Riddle out when they were kids, despite knowing about the situation with his mom, which is why he enabled Riddle to act out as dorm leader and, as Ace puts it, spoil him too much. After the overblot fallout, though, Trey tells Riddle how he was in the wrong to impose all those rules, and the house warden tearfully apologizes. 僕、本当はマロンタルトが食べたかったえバラは白だっていいしフラミンゴもピンクでいいお茶に入れるのは角砂糖より蜂蜜が好きだしレモンティーよりミルクティーが好きだみんなと食後のおしゃべりだってしたいリドルずっともっとトレイたちと。遊びたかった<笑>悪かったお前が苦しんでるの知ってたのにずっと見ないふりをしてた<笑>だから今日は言うよリドルお前のやり方は間違ってただからみんなにちゃんと謝るんだ<笑>ごめんなさい<笑>ごめんなさい
tender sweet moments and everyone is more than willing to let the situation end peacefully. Everyone except for Ace, of course, because he's never happy. Can't you see we're having a moment here? Jokes aside, while Ace is still rightfully angry, he tells Rito that he'll accept a brand new unbirthday party and apology tart to make up for all the trouble he caused in his tyranny, to which Rito complies. And so, a few days later, after the garden was repaired and no one is in the verge of death again, they hold their unbirthday party in high spirits. Riddle jokingly gives everyone a heart attack by pretending to have a meltdown over the white roses only to paint them over with magic, saying he can overlook a few missed roses, and showing how, bit by bit, he'll strive to be more lenient and more understanding with others and with himself, something we continue to see along the story. After episode 1, his character is constantly trying to improve and be better so he doesn't fall into old habits of being a control freak. Despite being incredibly smart, Riddle is shown to act younger than he is at times, prone to have fits of anger if the wrong buttons are pushed. He can also be a bit naive and stubborn, not giving up entirely on the compliance of the Queen's rules. Even so, Riddle is very curious by nature, willing to explore new activities he wasn't confident in so he could improve himself and his skills. He still enjoys studying and learning, being one of the few people to be happy when the headmage Crowley shows up in class, but instead of striving for his best alone, he's also seen to be more than willing to help others improve in a way that they can naturally understand. This earnest approach to self-evaluation and improvement earns him admiration from freshmen and juniors alike, and while I wouldn't say he's gained a lot of true friends, his circle of colleagues has definitely expanded greatly from when he entered Night Raven College. Even his relationship with Ace improves over time, as seen in the Ghost Bright event. <laughs> but that's in the future. In this current past, the first step to improving said relationship is handing over the apology tart to Ace, which he does. It's bad and it's salty, but he tried his best and that's what matters. Even Chenya drops by to give us a lore drop about a rival school called Royal Sword Academy, which I'm sure won't be relevant at all in the future. Royal Sword Academy? The episode's arc ends on a very cheerful note, with the dorm members, along with you and Grimm, celebrating merrily despite the circumstances they had to overcome in the last few days. Dorm Hash Labule has the very hard task of serving as the introduction to the Twisted Wonderland formula, explaining many of the core aspects of the world to the player, writing a compelling antagonist corruption and redemption arc, and doing all of that while juggling five main characters that compose the dorm. Performing just one of these isn't an easy feat, but Twist manages to do all of them and some more. I've seen a lot of people complain about Harslabue for being the first dorm in the narrative, because it's always the one first adapted into other media, so you may feel like you've seen the story over and over. But I kinda think this is the attention they rightly deserve. For starters, their dorm is the one with the most characters, so it makes sense that each of them will need some amount of screen time to develop. I mean, what kind of game that relies on character interactions would not give the right amount of screen time to one of their core characters. That's just lazy writing. But the students of Harslebule are never shoved to the side once their episode ends. Through events and personal stories, we get further glimpses into each and every one of these characters and how they behave with us, the main character, and with others that didn't appear in the episode. Not only that, but with the character arcs from episode 1 complete, fans can finally delve into the many other issues not tackled regarding everything else these characters need therapy for. You could honestly send a Harslabue fan into despair by just contemplating the relationship between Trey, Riddle and Cater, because to paraphrase yikes on bikes, those three have a lot to unpack. And of course, Ace and Deuce join you and Grimm in the best freshman squad ever, which will slowly gain more members over time. 
However, at its core, these four are basically always together the moment the prologue ends. There's this very lovely character analysis of the four of them by the user Pumpkin Carriage 3 on Tumblr. It goes into some mild spoilers for future books, so I won't go into that here. Links in the description to read at your own caution. But it essentially highlights how much Grimm, Ace and Deuce change over the course of the game, thanks to the friendship they formed with you. From mundane personal stories where they depict and playing games, to bigger events where they gather together to dance. It's a change in the dynamic that happens gradually over time. Of course, there are bumps in the road, especially between Ace and Deuce, but that's part of what makes this friend group so special and unique. Yu doesn't maintain a friendship with just the two of them, though. Every member of Harsabul is added to the friend list by the end of the episode, which is very helpful, since we work together with them to go against episodes 2 villain. That's right, one of my favorite parts of the twist formula is how it makes the characters from the previous chapter linger around for the next story and forces them to actively help in the conflict to conclude their still open story arcs. So, rest assured, Harslabule will return in episode 2, The Rebel of the Savannah, which I'll cover in the next video. Yeah, originally I had planned to go over every character and episode in a single take, but the script is already over 30 pages long and I barely scratched the surface of this game. So, just like every adaptation so far, I will only cover Harslabule and disappear forever. Goodbye. Kidding. I am, of course, fully planning on covering the rest of the story. I have way more ice cold takes to release into the world. But for now, I'll conclude the video on arguably the simplest yet hardest topic about Twist to grasp the gameplay elements. Twist has four main aspects of gameplay the gacha system, the leveling up card system, the fight system, and the rhythm game levels. One of these is not like the others. Let's start at the root of all the problems in society, the gacha system. Just like any gacha game, Twisted Wonderland relies on the people's love and attachment to the characters to drain the player's wallet dry. It has cards that range from rare to super rare to super super rare. Very creative, guys. Rare cards are arguably the easiest to retain. Though some still takes the months to come home, Leona. Usually featuring the character against a plain background with the closed set. Super rare cards are guaranteed when you do a temple or when you get a special key to buy one in the shop. With enough game currency, you can also buy a few of the rare cards. And super super rare cards are gifted upon you by the gods when they're feeling merciful. There's no guarantee when or how you get an SSR card. Some people have gotten them with a single pull and others can spend 99 pulls and the card will still evade them. The only time you're guaranteed to get an SSR card is after 100 pulls on the specific banner, when this little gauge at the bottom of the screen is filled up. This is our pity system. Use up all your gems, pull up a hundred times, and will allow you to get an SSR. But we don't guarantee for it to be the special one of the event, haha! <laughs> Screw you! Pull again! The banners range from special event banners, where specific cards have supposedly better drops, and standard banners, available all year round. Once you finish the third of the game, they give you a temple for free, where you can get your first set of cards, including your first SSR from the ones guaranteed. A little hint, always go for the SSR Riddle or Leona, they're very good. After you successfully sobbed over spending all your gems to get a single boy, it's time to buff them up. You do this by attending lessons. History lessons increase your level, flight lessons allow you to read the card's personal story, and alchemy lessons raise the bonds between two characters. Plus, it also gives you items to level up your spells. 
two minor but still important things to do with your card is the groovy function and the uncap function. The groovy function is simple. You collect these tiny little candles from doing alchemy lessons with the character or trading them in the alchemy shop and once you have enough of them you can use it to transform the card's artwork. Where cards get a little cloud effect and SR slash SSRs get an entire picture out of the change. It also boosts the attack power and HP. The uncap function is much simpler. The more of the same card you get, the more levels you can unlock. Get 4 R cards and the level cap changes from 40 to 60. 4 SR cards change the level cap from 60 to 80 and 4 SSR cards change it from 80 to 100. You can also use special perfumes to uncap them, but the amount and type will depend on the cards. Once you've got your 5 strongest boys, it's time for a good all due to death. Fights happen all throughout the story to events certain chapters, and can be also done in the exam screen. The battle system is element based, so as long as you memorize the weak and resistant combinations, you're good to go. Just assume the Pokemon rules. Water cards are strong against fire cards, fire cards are strong against nature cards, and nature cards are strong against water cards. And these grey ones, cosmic, are not strong or weak against any specific element. So usually set up your heaviest hitters or with the biggest health against them. You should also take advantage of the bonds and dual spells. A battle team always needs 5 characters cards to play, so try to combine cards that you can level up the bonds with in the alchemy lessons. Ace and Deuce or Tree and Cater, for example. Those pairs are available for dual moves as well, which are special spells unlocked after leveling up them to 5 or above. Once a dual spell is unlocked, you need to select that spell and pair the character with their dual partner, and they will unleash an even more powerful move thanks to the power of friendship and brotherhood described by historians. With all of this in mind, the process is a simple rinse and repeat. Feed the boys, force them to be friends, and bring hell to your enemies. The last and certainly the least important gameplay system is the rhythm game segments, called the twist tunes. But uh, <laughs> surprise, I've bamboozled you! See? It took so long to release this video that they released another gameplay element, the guest room. It's basically a decor mode where you craft special furniture and invite character over to look pretty. So Animal Crossing, you get it. The main drawback from this one is that you need to win a bunch of battles with a lot of different characters in the gauntlet to get materials to craft. A lot of battles. So, uh, while you can technically scrape by the story only pulling when necessary, you may need good cards for this one, if you want a pretty room. Y you kinda need those beefy card boys. My condolences. Anyway, back to the twist tunes. Just like the battles, tunes appear at certain points in the story, and you need to reach a minimum score to advance. But don't worry, they're usually fairly simple and always on the easy difficulty the first time you play them. Some of them are kinda honest to god bops, even when they have no rights to be. You can play them again on harder difficulties in the twist tune section of the main menu, to get more gems and even more in-game currency. Another little hint, you need to play it 10 times to get all the gems, but if you only just start it and let it play on its own, it will still count towards the goal even if you fail. Just start the tune, put down your phone and go do something else for the next 3 minutes. Don't waste your time perfecting them all like I did. Don't do it. Some of these get so hard it's not even funny. Just get the gems and don't look back. No! And 
this is the end. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, this is the first big video that I ever made. I wanted to post it long ago. I wanted to do it for the first anniversary of the English version, but that passed. <laughs> and then I tried to release it by the third anniversary of the Japanese version, but that also passed. <laughs> So yeah, this has been in the making for a long time, but I'm glad with how it turned out. And I hope that the next time I'm able to work a little faster. Uh, thank you to all the amazing artists that allow me to use their creations on the video. Again, links to their socials in the description. And I hope that you guys, if you guys liked it, you stick around. I do want to post more about Twist in the future. I have a lot of plans for more videos, hopefully smaller videos about uh, simpler topics to talk about. And I also plan to post part two someday. I still have books two through seven, maybe, if seven starts to release in English someday. Uh, but it might take a bit. I still have uni work and and other stuff but i i will be working on it if you want to be notified when i post another video uh, please subscribe or follow my socials i'm pretty active on twitter and tumblr and if you liked it do do comment or leave a like it will really boost my confidence to make the next part even better and yeah i think that's it have a great day, night in between, and uh, remember to stay safe, stay hydrated, and I'll see you next time.